this episode, I'm joined once again by theologian Kevin Hart to discuss his book, Lands of Likeness, for a Poetics of Contemplation, alongside discussions on Christian thought, secular philosophy, the work of Schopenhauer, and Agape. I'd like to say a big thank you to all my paying patrons and subscribers for making all of this work possible. And if you'd like to support the podcast and keep everything running, please find links in the description below. Otherwise, please have a great Christmas and enjoy. So, Kevin Hart, thanks once again for joining us on Hermetics Podcast. Pleasure. We are going to be discussing your book, Lands of Likeness for a Poetics of Contemplation, which was published this year, 2023, by University of Chicago Press, uh, who were kind enough to send me a, a copy for three. So thanks very much for them. And I will also say, before we get into the content of the book, the cover of the book is uh, a photograph, a very beautiful photograph of a, uh, a very small snail uh, crawling over a hand. And the reason I mention it is, is it's a photograph by your wife, I believe. Yes, it's a photograph by my wife, Sushana, um, and it's a photograph of our son, Jack. So the little snail is on his arm. It's part of a series of photographs that she's taken. And yet, yeah, no, it's a great cover. I mean, and it's very representative of contemplation, which we will be talking about. And if I was to try to describe this book before we, you know, get into the weeds, um, it's, a, I believe, it's a series of lectures, which were the Gifford Lectures for yourself in Glasgow between 2020 and 2023 on different topics relating to contemplation, philosophy, theology, and poetry as well, all intermingled, really surrounding the question of what what contemplation is and, and, and what we can do with it. That's that's very, very abstract. It doesn't really do justice to the book. But the, the questions I want to start with is because the last two conversations we've had, which have been very popular, have been around your other interest, which is the work of Maurice Blanchot. And yes. not to not to, to, to relegate him and, and your work on Blanchot, but that, that is sort of almost a secondary interest for you because you are primarily a theologian uh, or a philosopher and, and theologian. And so I wanted yeah. to ask, um, you know, what's the history of you as a theologian? And then coming through to what the history of this was of this book is. I mean, were, were you were you called? Um, it's yes. I, you're, you're quite right. I'm I'm primarily in the academic world a theologian, n- not a philosopher. Although I I studied philosophy um, when young and did two degrees in it, so I suppose I, I know a little bit about that. Um, the other side of my my work is literary, but I'm, I don't have a university position to to speak about that. What called me to theology was. Partly because I suppose from my early teenage years I became very interested in Christianity. And becoming interested in it meant that I was thinking about it, reflecting upon it, and wanted to be more precise and more capacious in in my thought about it. So that led me to theology in Australia, where I was growing up. Um, it was impossible in those days to study theology unless you were in priestly formation. But I most certainly didn't have a call to the priesthood so it was it was all done on my own on my own um, terms and uh, that's continued all the way through were you, so were you, you you say you have an interest in religion were you personal question i guess were you were you catholic from from day one or was it process of conver- uh, of adult conversion right no I, I was brought up um in the church of england which meant in those days with my family that um i wasn't brought up in religion at all um, Same as myself. So, right, right. And it was only when I was 13 and happened to be going to a local Baptist church, of all things, that I was converted to Christianity. And then over the process of my later teens and early 20s, I became Catholic. What converted you? To, to Catholicism. Uh, I guess, I, I, dare I say it, perhaps the bigger question is, what was the experience in the Baptist church that made you think, ah, oh. maybe there is something here? Well, it wasn't actually in the Baptist Church. I've, I've written a little book on this, actually, which comes out next year, uh, called Darkland, which is a memoir of my childhood up, up to this moment. Mm. That I was always at the bottom of my class in whatever I was doing. And in England, um, the headmaster came round to my parents and wanted me removed from the school since I was so dumb they couldn't do anything with me. And that was at the age of 10. They said there was no point sitting the 11 plus or anything like Mm -hmm. that. So my parents tried to have me um, apprentice to the local butcher, which didn't work out too well. 
We then emigrated to Australia, and I was still at the bottom of the class and everything. And then one day when I was 13, I, I was in a math class <laughs> where I always failed um, with elaborate elam. Uh, and I had this strange experience of my mind being completely opened, as though there was a rusted window there that was forcefully just pulled open. And thereafter, in the next couple of weeks, I passed from being at the bottom of the class in everything to being at the top of the class in everything. And I didn't know quite what to make of this experience, but I was led to the view um, that it, it was God intervening mm -hmm. at some stage. And maybe that vocabulary wouldn't have come to my mind if I hadn't been going to the local Baptist church. Mm. That's a very, that's a quite astounding grace. It, it was an absolutely pivotal moment, and, and I've never really recovered from it. And sometimes I, well, I used to wonder more than I do now if that, if that window would just slam shut again. I don't. Th I, well, I hope not. It seems you know <laughs> it's, it's remained. Um, so then I guess, I guess just to stay on this, stay on this thread is uh, to pull it all together. I mean, then the move through to Catholicism, I would assume maybe it was just from your own your own study and and the the general Catholic arguments. Yes, um, I think it was in large part. Um, because I started to feel a lot more at home in the Catholic Church, which has got many different um, profiles mm. that you you can follow. There's much more room for a person to develop spiritually in the Catholic Church than in the Protestant churches, it seemed to me. And, of course, um, the intellectual charism is very much valued in the Catholic Church, as well as the contemplative tradition. Which is a good segue. So here we are talking about contemplation. So I believe I was right in saying this. This is a book of lectures, the Gifford lectures from Glasgow, right. twenty to twenty-three. So I, you know, I'm I'm not familiar with the process of the Gifford lectures myself. Was this a, a decision of yourself? You're invited, and then you can do it along a topic of your choosing. Okay, the Gifford lectures. Yes, I was invited. I got an email, and the Gifford lectures are always to do with natural theology. Mm -hmm. That's how they were set up by Lord Gifford. And so I had to come to a, a way of presenting lectures which did something new with the idea of natural theology. Mm -hmm. And contemplation was the answer? Yes, um, because contemplation is partly a, a religious activity and partly a natural activity. The, the ancient Greeks were engaged in contemplation, mm -hmm. um, and that was before there was any Christianity at all. And then later in the uh, early 18th century, later 18th century, all the way through the 19th and 20th centuries, there were different philosophers who tried to recover and extend the notion of natural contemplation. Mm. So from Kant, Schopenhauer, uh, Coleridge to some extent, and Husserl, they all rethought uh, philosophy on the basis of contemplation. So the foundation here then is is natural theology. Yes, that, it, it starts off with the Greeks in that way and is taken up in Christianity very early on. Mm -hmm. Do you feel it's lost a natural theology, which I'll ask you for maybe for a short definition of natural theology, but do you feel um, it's lost its popularity and we've got caught up in more, ab uh, theologic, more theological abstractions? I think natural theology is alive and well in contemporary analytic philosophy. Mm. Um, it is less alive and well in European philosophy and theology. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to um, extend it, give it a lease of new life by, by the kinds of things that I do in Lands of Likeness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how, how are we understanding natural theology here? Okay. Well, natural theology generally has got two facets. One is looking at the natural world for traces of God. The other way is using the natural mind in order to reach God by proofs for the existence of God, for example, or demonstrating that it is reasonable to believe in God. So it has two aspects. So what's in our way? When we contemplate the natural world, or we use our mind, this isn't a, this isn't a straight shot to God. What is it that's getting in our way? Um, well, lack of evidence with regard to 
um, the natural world, because you can also see a lot of things in the natural world which don't incline you to think of God. Uh, you see a lot of pain, a lot of disease, uh, a lot of trauma, and that is not going to lead you to um, an idea of God. Uh, the, the mind works pretty well, but it seems to um, run into barriers when trying to think of, of God. Um, sometimes that could be useful because we can run into an intellectual barrier, and if we experience and weigh the uh, kind of um, repulsion that we get by banging into a wall, then we can start to think of God otherwise. When you find that the mind can't do it just by itself, then maybe you will think you have to think of it in terms of love, of of, um, of consideration of people, and indeed of revelation. So there's a certain point where we have to put reason aside. Well, you put reason in a particular place, give it a particular role where it doesn't rule the roost. Mm. And would you say this is a, a good entryway into what we are, what we consider, what, what you might consider contemplation to be? Is this this process of clearing out these hurdles, clear dealing dealing with that uh, communication, that investigation into God naturally? Contemplation, um, in terms of Christianity, uh, is really to do with a kind of resting in God, resting in God as the truth. Um, it's not a quest for God in the way that natural theology generally has been. Um, now, I think what happened in modern philosophy from the 17th century on is that certain things were forgotten about contemplation, and they were brought back only much later. So um, contemplation can, is, a kind of, is the mind, as it were, resting in God, not searching for him. So if I was to ask you a very broad question then, because uh, yeah. often the terminology, especially I think, especially with with Chris, uh, Christian forms of we could say worship, you get into the murky waters of definitions. And so, really, yeah. I'd say we have three, which is prayer, meditation, and contemplation, which of which each have uh, a long history with Christianity. Yes, but they differ. So, if they I was differ. to ask you how they how they differ. Prayer has got two dimensions, one of which is petitionary prayer, where you're asking for mm. things. And, uh, the other dimension is that it's contemplative or meditative. Okay, in meditation, we actually have dis a discursive thought going on. It's going from A to B. We're reading a text, uh, maybe from scripture, maybe from a church father, maybe from a, a mystical work, and we are following it. Or we're following a train of images um, in a church, for example. In contemplation, it's non-discursive. Um, one thing I like to quote on this is Pseudo Dionysius the Areopagite, who says that the soul has got three possible movements. One is straight, one is circular, and one is spiral. And the straight line is discursive prayer, meditation or consideration, as it came to be called later. And the circular and spiral movements are contemplation. So when we're contemplating something, we're not moving from A to B. We're going around in a circle, and ideally getting richer as we go along, or going along in a spiral and taking more and more of reality in as we go. That uh, The openness, then, of contemplation seems to be, uh, seems to have a greater reliance on faith in in prayer yes in contemplative prayer it, it, it presumes faith hope and charity um, in natural contemplation however like the contemplation of nature mm. no i mean one of the big questions in the history of contemplation has been is god the only legitimate object of contemplation so aquinas for example says yes but not all theologians have said yes. Uh, in the 12th century, Richard of St. Victor um, said that you can contemplate anything. And he had the idea that you can start in nature by just contemplating a blade of grass or a leaf. And somehow, as you contemplate that, you will be impelled to go higher. 
and then higher and higher until you eventually reach God. So you can start contemplating almost anything at all, anything that's not disgusting. Hmm. Out of interest to me, perhaps it's a little bit of a crass question. I, uh, it's something I've been thinking about recently. I mean, maybe we can probably move away from something disgusting, but this notion of contemplating everything, there's this, there's almost a, a, you know, I can't remember where I, heard, where I heard the quote, but someone once said, Christianity is a springtime religion. And when you think yeah. of Christianity, you think of... Um, you know the lamb, the symbology of of rebirth, of of hope, of you know um, sun rising and not setting, and there seems to be a, like a half of existence, darkness, the night, um, pain as well. You could add in there, but the, the the dark side of of things. Why why are we perhaps reluctant or shouldn't contemplate that to get? Why won't that possibly take us to God? Is it a bad route? Okay. Um, I think there's two things. One is um, how we go in quest of God, how we, we attain some kind of sense of assurance of divine love. The other is once we achieve it, how we try to stay there, which is we can't stay there for very long. Contemplation never takes very long. It's only a matter of a, a few minutes usually. Um, we can uh, search for God by way of thinking of the problem of evil, the problem of our own pain, the problem of our own mortality, all of these things. And you may use those things to come to some degree of assurance of God's reality. Um, but in dwelling upon them, you're not dwelling on upon the truth of God. You're, you're dwelling upon how we get to God. Dare I ask, what is the truth of God that is arrived at via contemplation? Okay, well, traditionally, it's based upon the idea of what Jesus says in the Gospel of John, I am the truth. So, for Aquinas in particular, when we contemplate God, we're always abiding in the truth of Christ. So there's something going on here then in this, uh, the act of contemplation, we, we could say. I mean, and you, you mentioned pseudo-Dionysius there with these directions. Mm -hmm. And this is something that's emphasized in, in many of your, or your lectures in the book, which is what the relationship is between subject and object, um, yes. between the subject that is contemplating and the object which then you know, subjectivism and objectivism have had a fairly shaky history recently of the idea that sub the subjective knowledge is all opinion and objective mm -hmm. is complete truth, whereas, you know, the subjective has a relationship with the object to build the truth. But I think, for me, this notion of the subject and the object, I think a lot of the cloud of unknowing, of yes. the subject consistently disappearing. Yes. So what is happening to the subject in the act of contemplation is the big question. Okay. Yes, this is an excellent question. Um, I've been practicing contemplative prayer for many years, so I, I, I've got some reflection upon it. And I think what happens is when you begin uh, contemplative prayer, when you begin the process at any, on any given day, the I, the ego, the self, starts to be relaxed. And it has the feeling of turning down a switch where oneself is is still there but it's like turning a light switch and getting a much lower light you don't have the the sharp harsh light of the ego reflecting on everything and so this, once that happens the subject object relation begins to fade and so you you tend not to think of god so much as an object as a particular being out there that we have to encounter, that God is within as well as without, and God is involved in the subject as well. In in contemplation, I think we tend to approach what theologians call the imago Dei, the image of God within ourselves. And when we find that, we can rest in it for a short time, usually only a few minutes. So why only a few minutes does something come in to intrude, to, to invade that experience? Right. I think there are two reasons. One is if you look at the entire narrative of Christianity, something went awfully wrong in our relationships with God a long time ago. And we're fallen, broken creatures, and we, we can't sustain 
a relationship with the infinite for very long. That just seems to be an impossibility. We can get better and better at it with practice, but we can't spend our entire lives in that kind of intimate relationship with God. Um, also, when one's practicing contemplative prayer or any kind of contemplation, the smells that come into the room, reminding you you're hungry, the sounds that come into the room that are distracting, the memories that come in, anticipations, anxieties, all of these things are perfectly natural, and you have to develop a way of dealing with them. There's a kind of, as I, as I you often have in, in all religions, this happens, you develop a mantra that you say very softly, which is like a a, a little feather that you you just float things out of your mind by saying it, so they don't distract you. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner, is the... Right, for the Orthodox, it, exactly, that's what they say. Or, or just a two-syllable word like Father, Jesus, Mary, something like that. Mm. Is there a contemplative relationship with those intrusions? Is that a sort of uh, uh, something for those that have fallen to take on, to humble them? I think it's a, a reminder of our mortality and, and sinfulness that these things happen. Um, but they are they're, re, they're relatively easy easy to overcome. Th those distractions are. What's less easy to overcome is those days when contemplation just doesn't work, mm. where you're just left feeling dry and as though you're wasting your time. So contemplation is a kind of landscape where there are many valleys as well as a few peaks. You know, that notion of dryness, I remember reading St. Teresa of Avila, and she said that her, pretty much the majority of her spiritual life had been extremely dry, and you read it and wonder how she ever came to write what she wrote. If her, if her whole experience was dry, it's quite astounding. It, 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 it is, and you know, you've just got to keep on trudging through the lowlands <laughs> in, in order to get any, any elevation at all. So to, to jump back to this subject-object thing, this... I think has a well it does has a relationship with two two thinkers one one who I wasn't so surprised to uh, see turn up because I, I believe Husserl so one the two thinkers are Husserl and Schopenhauer who who play yeah. a, a big role in one of your lectures Husserl uh, Lutheran I believe and I think he moved at mm -hmm. some point was he something he, he was Jewish to begin with and moved to the Lutheran Church so he was Lutheran so I wasn't too too surprised to see him there uh, with this you know this subject object relationship is is you know another way in a way of saying a phenomenological from a phenomenological relationship but we also have Schopenhauer and these two are in dialogue for yourself with regards to to contemplation so what was the importance of these two what do yes. they reveal to us okay well Kant begins this. Um, in the Critique of Judgment, his last major work. And there he introduces contemplation of art and contemplation of nature. So he's not interested in the contemplation of God, but he's interested in contemplation. And he thinks that um, for his theory of art to work, we have to be able to contemplate an artwork or the natural world. Schopenhauer develops this idea um, greatly. He, he remembers one of the great pessimists in philosophy. Um, and the world is always obtruding upon him and causing pain. But he thinks that if we engage in aesthetic contemplation of nature or art, for a few precious moments, we can still our minds. We can take the hive of our minds, as it were, and stop all that buzzing. And so he thinks that that is the one release that we get in a life of pain, of misery, uh, a, a life which is perpetually dark. And so it's art, which for him is the great, um, it's not God, it's art, which we contemplate. And that will give us peace. And that sort of uh, that Schopenhauerian liberation, I believe, is is connected to, for him would be the, uh, you, you have a momentary um relationship with a platonic idea yes he is in his account of contemplation he's very much a platonist so i look at the tree outside my window and if i look at it for long enough i will start to see 
the form of the tree and the actual tree around in the 21st century is of no real concern anymore. And I'm released from time. I'm released from causality. I'm released from the principle of sufficient reason. All of those things. Where does he, where does he go wrong? I don't know that he goes wrong. In fact, um, for most artists, most novelists, the theory of art that they really resonate with is Schopenhauer's. Um, uh, Proust, Wagner, many others have all gone to um, to Schopenhauer. Now, if you're interested in religious contemplation, it's not going to go the whole way mm. because he he doesn't think that, that that works. There's no God in his system at all. But it's a very important twist in the history of contemplation because it shifts the emphasis from God to nature and art. And in many ways, that's what's remained in the 20th century and the 21st century. Um, the church has been very poor at teaching uh, churchgoers about contemplation. How many times, if you've ever been to church, have you ever heard a sermon on contemplative prayer? It doesn't happen. So that whole enormous aspect of Christian formation has been put in abeyance. And the church has a certain responsibility with respect to that, particularly after Vatican II. Why do you, th why do you think that is, that there's a reluctance to, uh, I guess, preach? You know, when I think of preaching preaching practicality, which is really, you know, teaching methods, tools of, commun of, of communion with God, which are very personal, contemplation, prayer. I think of, you know, the hot water that Meister Eckhart got himself into with his uh, mm -hmm. his sermons of um which were extremely practical and through to the through to the, the parishes and the the layman. Do you do you oddly, I mean, do you perhaps think that that sort of reluctance to give over this sort of practicality is still there? Well, in the in the homilies and sermons I've heard, <laughs> I mean there's a huge range of quality in them of course, but most of them are focused upon trying to explain morality in and through Scripture, trying to keep people more or less on the rails for one more week. And they're not really concerned with cultivating the inner life of people. Now, the thing is, this, this is a real problem because the heart of Christianity is prayer. And if you're not actually teaching people how to pray, not just in terms of petitions. Lord, won't you give me a Mercedes Benz? My friends all have Porsches. I must make amends. Um, if you're not, if you're not, if that's the limit of all that you're teaching people, you're not getting very far in the relationship with God. People really do need they hunger, I think, for some kind of tranquility on the one hand and some kind of intimacy with God on the other. Would you would you say Christian acts? are imbalanced if one isn't taught how to be a Christian. Yeah. Which is... but, yeah, I think that puts it pretty well. Um, you know, Christianity, on the one hand, is an extremely complicated religion. Um, you can spend your, you can spend 10 lives studying it and still not get to the bottom of it. On the other hand, it's something so simple any child can understand. And if you look at the simple poll, it's loving God and loving neighbor. Yeah. Now, if you're loving God, you're not just going to be perpetually asking him things. Mm. Please give me this. Please do this. Please do that. As though God is a cosmic vending machine. You want to have some kind of relationship with him. And just as in uh, ordinary relationships of friendship and love, uh, one's relationship with one's partner, for example, there are times when you're not talking, where you're just being together and enjoying being together. And contemplative prayer is all about that. So without that kind of love of God, you're not going to have the strength. You're not going to have the ability or the interest, really, to love the neighbor. It just reminds me, sort of a, a, a Christian, well, uh, an appreciation of, I believe it was Pascal, you know, all, all, yes. all man's problems would be solved if he could sit on his own for five minutes in a room. So sort of just That's right. change that a little I, bit to I, sit I on love his own that, with sorry. Yes, me too, because I believe it to be absolutely true. But if we just tweak it a little bit, five minutes alone in a room with God, we might get somewhere. Well, one of the oddities with human beings, I think, is a lot of the people, you know, I live in America, so it's, it's a strongly Christian culture of a particular kind. 
A lot of people notionally think they want to spend eternity with God, which is fine. But in daily life, they don't want to spend more than five minutes with mm. God. What's that? Contemplative prayer generally takes, I don't know, 20 to 25 minutes a day. If you don't want to do that and achieve some kind of relationship with God in this life, why would you spend want to spend eternity with God? Why is it so painful for so many people then? Well, in America, we're overly busy. We're not even busy. We just have a patina of busyness. Um, there are people who say, I've got no time in my day to do this. Well, I understand what it's like to be busy. I'm sufficiently busy myself. But there's always a thing called lunchtime. Um, and you can take about half of your lunch hour and engage in contemplation. There are people I know who don't have offices who contemplate on park benches, in libraries, there's on buses. There's one man I met who contemplates on buses. Even people who will go into a bathroom and in order not to be disturbed and contemplate there. So it's always possible. But it's not always peaceful. No, it's not always peaceful because you can be interrupted by noises. You can be interrupted sometimes just by the light. And also what comes to mind, um, when you start contemplation, often bad things from your unconscious come to the top, bad memories you've had, feelings of worthlessness, of uselessness. All of these things come flooding to the surface. In the older days, one would have a spiritual advisor with whom you could talk about these things. Now, the church doesn't provide anything like that. And it can be very dangerous if one is of a fragile disposition, engaging in contemplation without anyone to talk with about it can really lead to uh, trauma. Spiritually speaking, are these are these tests? Is this a grace? These these um, this stuff that arises in contemplation? Yeah, I think it's an obstacle course of sorts. Um, you have to go through this and overcome things. You have to show persistence even when you're not gaining anything. In fact, the idea of gaining anything has to be put aside. Um, you're not there to gain anything from God. You're not asking God for anything. You're trying to be in a relationship of stillness with God. And you shouldn't feel that there should be anything pious or holy about the exercise um, you have to put all of this aside and risk going out onto the high seas, as it were, just in your own little boat. And being completely open. I mean, we're we're, we're treading awfully close to negative theology here. I mean, back to also, I've already mentioned him, but Meister Eckhart was very big on stop asking God for things. That's not what he's, you know, that's not what he's there for. What do you, with I guess with regard to contemplation, what is it we're doing when we do drag something of ourselves and we sort of, you know, in the back of our minds, we think, well, I'll contemplate, but could I, you know, could you just help me with this job, this job interview? Or, I, you know, I could quite do with that raise or that promotion or that new car. Yeah. What are we transforming God into? How is the, how is contemplation there being sort of abused when we do that? Oh, well, when we contemplate, we have to put all of that aside. There's a very legitimate role for petitionary prayer, to ask God for this or that. But we, I don't think really that we ask God for things. Um, we, are, we should ask God for graces to deal with things. As I say to students, you know, you shouldn't ask God to help you with your essays. You might want to ask God to give you the grace so that you can persist in your work so that you'll do well in your essays. That's a different thing. With regard to negative theology, apophatic theology, yeah, I mean, let, let's bound up with contemplation, as, as you're suggesting. In apophatic theology, we come to God in the darkness of love. We don't, we're not coming to God with a prior sense of certitude, of having brought God into the horizon of knowability, of apodictic certainty, of proof that we come into God. Um, completely disarmed, hoping to meet him with an assurance of his love, not anything more. And with also uh, an awareness 
that divine love might be somewhat different from human love. How do you feel they differ? Well, divine love is what we call in Greek uh, agape or uh, caritas in, in, in Latin, and it's to do with sacrificial love. Very little of what we do in our normal human engagements, one with another, is agape. It can be that. In, in a good marriage, there's elements of agape. There's also elements of philia, friendship, as well as eros, uh, uh, the erotic in, in love. Uh, a really good marriage has all of those things going on in it. But it, it's very rare, I think. You know, in America, we use the word love in a very banal way, um, with nothing behind it, not even friendship often, because friendship uh, requires um, requires things of us. It's, it requires all kinds of reciprocal obligations and interests and concerns. And that often is not acknowledged in the United States, let alone anything higher than it. We're always dragging conditions with us. Right. We're always trying to find sufficient reasons for things, conditions. <laughs> and once you have conditions, God is not going to bow to our conditions. That, that's just not going to work. Um, God will give himself freely. But if we put up conditions, then that's not going to work. And we know from our ordinary uh, relationships, one with another, the conditions are not like this. In America, people now are, are brought up to have a checklist of what they want in their friends, let alone romantic interests. People go out on a first date and are mentally checking off the boxes. Mm. Is he interested in politics? Check. Is he interested in race? Check. Does he have a liberal viewpoint or a conservative viewpoint? Check. And so on. Now, whatever that is, it's not going to lead to love because you're putting forth very clear conditions on it. It might possibly um, uh, make that person seem likable to you, but it may not go further than that. Whatever love is, and it's very difficult to define, it's going to exceed those kinds of conditions. And you don't really get a say in it. No, you feel chosen. You feel you feel that you. Well, you get yeah. You get the, you, the, that's the say you get. You get the choice. You always yeah. get the choice. Right. So you mentioned there that love has become this very pithy, almost annoying thing in contemporary, uh, especially contemporary politics. People, you know, love. People say love is all or something like that, and quickly throw right. it out there, and it means nothing. Do you feel the same thing has happened with prayer? I think it's just taken for granted in the church, my church, in the Catholic church. Uh, there's very little attention paid for it. It's, it's as though if you go to mass, that should suffice for the week. Maybe in America, people say grace or have petitionary prayer, all of which is fine. But there's no sense of leading people into thinking of God as someone with whom you want to be in relation. Uh, to be, as Aquinas says very beautifully, to enjoy friendship with God. That's different from uh, fear. Yes, it's very different from fear. Uh, obviously, um, for Aquinas, it presumes that you have had a moral uh, reformation, that you're, you've given up your bad habit of robbing banks, for example. You can't then get into a, a relationship with God in, in that way. Um, you have to have given up those sorts of things. But you have to be um, wanting to be in relationship with God. And for Aquinas and for many other people, God always makes the first move. God always makes the first move in prayer. He's always called us, and our prayer is always a response to that, to that initial call. So we can, never, we can never make a demand? No, no, no. no we're not in a position to. Um, Aristotle said, you know, God is so far above us that we can't really be in a relationship with him, certainly not a friendly relationship. But Aquinas curiously changed that because he had the example of Jesus who said, I no longer call you my servants, I call you my friends. So I want to, I do want to jump back to uh you know, uh, almost the opposite of this discussion. Well not the not the opposite, but he's doing his own thing, Mr. Schopenhauer. Um this notion of having a contemplative relationship with art is there a is there a means unto which one can have that but it becomes divine that we understand the artwork as 
you know, something that has, in a way, been a gift, as all is from God, the contemplation yes. of art becomes a gift. I think so, yes. Um, there are certain works which, as Rilke said, when we look at them, we we feel that the artwork is saying to us, you must change your life. Mm. The certain music we listen to where we do have a sense of self-evaluation going on. Um, if you go to a gallery, there are certain paintings people gather around and have some kind of communion mm. with. They contemplate them, and I don't doubt that they feel changed or feel a need to change, to deepen in some way, to become a better human being. It may not always be religious. It may be simply moral, but it can it can have a spiritual dimension, to be sure. But then there's many insincere, I would say, insincere and almost inverted communions with artworks. Andy Warhol's soup cans or the Mona Lisa, for instance. Right. A lot of what happens when you look go in front of an artwork is there's different possibilities before you. We can become fascinated by an artwork. And when that happens, you can't remove your eyes from it whether it be a poem or a piece of visual art or a statue or even a piece of music that we keep playing over and over and over, there's a state of fascination where you can't remove your eyes from it, but that it doesn't give you anything, that you're frozen. There's something dark about it. Um, but with contemplation, there's a sense rather of freedom of the mind and the heart that you can move from one aspect, one profile of something to other profiles, whether it be of God or, or nature. It's an interesting word you just used there that, that us moderns love to throw around, which is freedom, which is almost our, our, top, virtue, our top, uh, top thing everyone's after, is freedom. Right. It's a horrible version of freedom. And I, I actually want to, as you've mentioned, the contem contemplation, connection to freedom, contemplation gives you freedom. I'd like to connect that back to your own experience with the window opening, because that window opening, many moderns would say, well, that's not freedom, because all of a sudden you probably had to do a lot more schoolwork. So what is this? <laughs> what, how do these two modes of freedom differ? And what is, the, what is the kind of freedom that's being afforded us by that grace of contemplation? Okay. I remember sufficiently well how I felt when I was 13 and had that strange experience. Uh, first of all, it, it was as though I was opening the window, the window has been open, and I could see this infinite horizon. And no matter, I, I felt as though I hadn't eaten for 13 years. Mm -hmm. And so I was very, very hungry intellectually. And I just kept, as it were, running across the meadow in front of me with the horizon perpetually before me, with this sense of sheer delight at the plenitude of things there that life offered, and part of them being intellectual offerings. So th that feeling has never really gone away from me. There's an utter freedom um, from that moment on. Yeah, I mean, there was a lot of schoolwork to do, but it had been very oppressive in not understanding anything. That was just terrible. Mm. I always felt that I was put into a closet somewhere and the door had been closed. I was just in darkness. And that was no... No fun whatsoever. And of course, you know, when when you're actually engaging in contemplation, after a while, particularly when it goes well, you feel that you can let go of the niggling things of life, the petty things of life coming from within oneself or indeed being inflicted upon you by your job or by neighbors or whoever it happened to be, that you do you can free yourselves from those, and thus you can free yourself to other things, that you get a larger sense of, of perspective, a larger sense of the possibilities of life with one another, to be sure, but also intellectually. You can have much more curiosity. Your mind is more open, you're more generous with questions that you're prepared to ask. What then is the more, what is the freedom that we more often hear about? How do you think it's a, a mutation of that sort of freedom? The freedom in America is not freedom. <laughs> the, the, the everyday freedom mm. in America is not freedom at all. It's a matter of choice. Uh, a good example is if you go to the supermarket, if you want to buy some cereal, you go along the cereal um, aisle, which is enormous, and you see 75 varieties of exactly the same thing. 
mm. often made by the same company. Um, so you have freedom to choose whichever one you want. But the freedom is actually illusory. They're just minute variations on the same thing. So we're concerned about, in America, one of the things we hear about all the time is freedom from, mm. freedom from too much government regulation, for example, uh, which we have to some degree. Uh, but we also, the more important freedom is freedom too. But people, by and large, when given freedom to, don't use it. Mm. I mean, in America, we're remarkably free to do lots of things, but we don't do them. So there's a, there's a strange, sort of almost, uh, dare I say, it, a strange sort of mathematics here for the freedom, the everyday freedom, freedom to add or freedom to get rid or freedom to choose is always an addition and amalgamation uh, and a, or an a grant something's. You know, I need more, or I need more, or I want to get rid, or something's changing yeah. empirically. But the freedom right. of God is—it's not mathematic in that sense. There isn't a, there isn't a right. I've got that. Right. I mean, for a start, in in Christianity, um, unlike a lot of other world religions, um, God always is freely giving. Mm. So, and one thing that God gives you is the opportunity not to be restricted by one's own finitude uh, in a bad sense or one's own guilt, one's own sinfulness. And to be free of those things is to be free to do other things, to have better relationships with God and with uh, friends and with neighbors. I think it also has an intellectual component too. One is free to read and to think and to to contemplate what you're reading, to go deeper into things. And that's a, a good place to sort of segue into the other foundation of your book, which is poetry, which is your, yes, your yes. sort of – poetry seems to be your true love. Well, since, I was, since that event happened when I was 13 <laughs> years old, that's when I started writing poems and started really reading poems seriously. Well, I hope that event happens to me because I still have no – I have no ear for – for poetry at all, unfortunately. But what 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 is it about poetry that has something specific for contemplation? There's a certain um, some you know something I'm something I'm uh, become obsessed with recently is from a previous discussion about modernism. Is there two modes from Auerbach's book Mimesis of two modes of of literature? One that one that describes everything, such as James mm -hmm. James Joyce's Ulysses, and then something that. The, what you're, what's actually most important is what hasn't been described, what's been left out, which is something like, right. such as Kafka. And it seems that poetry is oh, oh, more often than not leaning to that second mode of it's the what's been left out, what's coming through, what's what's what hasn't been decided. It's probably true that is when we think of poetry, we think of poets of people who managed to do the extraordinary thing of moving the invisible so it becomes visible. Mm. So Kafka is a great example of this. No one had quite seen the world as Kafka saw it. But after Kafka, after you read novels and stories by Kafka, you see that all the time. Mm. Um, so every great artist, I think, does this. They they take things which were there but invisible. And then they render them visible to some extent. Now, in, in poetry, more than in prose, um, when we write it, and particularly when we read it, I think we're more given to circles and spirals, as Pseudo Dionysius would put it, than straight lines. Mm -hmm. There are people who read poems, sometimes professors of English, <laughs> who read them only in terms of straight lines and turn the poem into a kind of theorem. Mm -hmm. But I think we read poetry better when we are thinking of reading it and then going back, looking at something we might have missed, taking in something more of a metaphor that might have been there that we hadn't realized was as rich as we had first thought when reading it. So we, we go back and it spirals out and out and out till we get a remarkably full uh, emotional and intellectual experience from the poem. So in, in the book we're talking about, I, I propose what I call a hermeneutic of contemplation, mm. which is 
reading poetry with that kind of freedom to dwell on particular things going in circles or going in spirals, not to reduce it to a straight line, to a theorem, that, as though the poet is trying to prove something, and certainly not always to use the hermeneutic of suspicion whereby we're always being suspicious mm. of some kind of ideology which is being foist upon us. Sometimes that happens, and we don't like it. Yeah. So there's always, a posi- there's always a role for that, but it's not the only role. And in university um, education, it's become pretty much a dominant, almost exclusive way of reading. So your reading is very sincere. Um, I hope it's open, mm. at least. Um, look, there are things, I think, when you're reading a poem, or reading anything for that matter, where we can be genuinely surprised mm-hmm. and have genuine admiration and genuine wonder. And if our reading doesn't contain those things, I don't know why we would do it. Could you give an example of a, of a passage of poetry that, that you recall first gave you that, that response? Yeah, I can remember it very clearly. And again, it was about when I was 13 years old, uh, when I bought for about 25 cents at a local bookstore the, at the Penguin edition of the poems of Gerard Manley Hopkins mm. and read his extraordinary poem, The Windhover, which I talk about in Lands of Likeness. And I had the feeling of being full of admiration for the poem, but of being opened to a whole way of seeing natural events, something as simple as looking up and seeing a bird flying in the sky. This was no longer one event among others. It became emblematic of a whole new relationship with the world that one could have. And that invisible, do you think that invisible that can come through, that appears, maybe not can be God literally, but but, but, uh, is the voice of God maybe, you know, is 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 something there? I don't want to say is God because that's quite, that would be quite something. Well, that would be quite something. One shouldn't deny that it happens, but Mm. one doesn't presume either Mm. that in the Catholic faith, there's a very nice notion called prevenient grace. Mm. That's to say, when God gives you the ability to decide something or see something in advance of the graces you will need later. So most often we think of this as when we're adolescents, like you're at college, and you're wondering what you're going to do in life. Will I become a doctor, a lawyer, a professor? Will I become a school teacher? Will I do this, that, or the other thing? And Prevenient grace is that which allows us to think about these possibilities without incurring anything, uh, any, any, any sinfulness. So you imagine yourself to be a lawyer. You imagine yourself to be a professor, a doctor, a teacher. And you might do this for some weeks or months. Mm. And there's, there's nothing wrong in this because once you make up your mind, mm. then you're going to need certain graces to get through and do that other work. All those years of being a school teacher, which is a very demanding job, and one certainly needs grace to get through the week as a school teacher. And in in doing your line of work of reading all of these different books coming at you from every possible angle, that you need a certain grace to be able to do all of that, to gain understanding, to work out what you're going to talk with people about. Mm. What is it if we don't follow those signs? Chaos, I suspect. Mm. Anxiety, depression, all of those things. Do you think where that, that's where the modern world's gone wrong? Um, I think it's probably the world as such. I don't think modernity has got many good things about it as well as many bad things. But it's not as though the, the patristic age or the medieval age was any better. We've always been fallen. We've always been fallen. Is there anything you'd like to add about your book that we haven't uh, that we haven't touched upon? I will I will I will just say I mean we've kept the, the conversation fairly broad. I mean the lectures in the book themselves are you know usually on a specific writer such as Hopkins or Schopenhauer or herself, so they're a bit, right. more, a bit more uh, a bit or around a specific theme. But we've kept it fairly broad. But is there anything you'd like to to add about it? You feel is key? Okay. Well, I mean, if you read the book, you'll find that you'll probably learn a lot more about contemplation. One's eyes will be opened a little bit, perhaps, to new possibilities. But if you're simply interested in literature, 
in in poetry in particular, I think you'll find a new way of reading poems and thinking about them and what they can do for you, which is a mode of reading that's not yet taught in universities and colleges, but is probably a lot closer to one's own way of reading at home, as it were. How would you advise one to begin with contemplation? Oh, well, um, if one's a believer, then it's very easy. I would always suggest uh, Lectio Divina, which is a very ancient 6th century way of, uh, uh, of prayer, that you start um, after making the sign of the cross and saying the Our Father, you start reading, say, two, three, or at most four verses of Scripture, and you come to a lexical understanding of them. What does this mean grammatically? Do I understand the words? From there, you engage in meditation upon the passage, which enables the mind to roam around the scriptures, uh, theology, philosophy, uh, whatever. And after meditating for a few minutes, you pray about what you have just been reading. That's to say you apply it to your own situation in life. Once you've taken it on into your own being, then you can contemplate. Namely, you simply rest in the assurance that God has heard your prayers, that he loves you, that he's concerned about you and wants to, to have you nourished. And you contemplate for a few minutes, and then you come out of that, that prayer. You make the sign of the cross, and you go back into your normal life. That takes about 20, 25 minutes, um, and anyone can do it. Mm. Now, if you're not a believer, mm. you can also contemplate. You can... Uh, in the middle of the day, you can leave your office um, and try to find somewhere quiet and just look at a bush, look at a tree. It, it doesn't need very much at all. You don't have to find a spectacular, beautiful sunset or anything like that. And by concentrating, by attending to the actual object, you can turn off oneself to some extent. You can stop having your name written inside in bold letters and erase the self. And in doing that, for a short time, uh, you'll find that you go back uh, very refreshed and more open to the afternoon. Do you think in time via that contemplation one would come to God? One can. I don't think God obtrudes himself. God always gently calls, um, but there are people, uh, morally very good people, who simply don't make that step. Um, but they are, there are people who I think in searching for the truth, like mathematicians, for example, there might be an atheist or agnostic mathematician working hard at a particular theorem and find you know, very sincerely looking for the truth. Mm. If one's looking for the truth, one also indirectly finds God. God and the truth can't be separated. That would be that would be a terrible thing. I think it's a good place to finish up. I'll be sure to put uh, links for Lands of Likeness in the description below for those that are interested. Um, and it would make a great Christmas gift for, for those who are interested in contemplation. And so you're now working on a memoir of your early years. And I think last time you said about you're working on another book of poetry yep well um in june next year a book of mine called dark darkland memoir of a secret childhood comes out with paul dry books and um that's about my first 13 14 years mm -hmm. of life i've also coming out about the same time is another little book on contemplation much shorter than lands of likeness uh, and also concerned with contemplation in other world religions and that's the kind of book one could read on the train going to work, as it were. Lands of likeness might be a little more demanding. And now I'm just starting to write a book on Soren Kierkegaard. But of course, there's always poems, though. That just no, nothing stops that. Nothing has stopped that since I was 13. I mean, I'm, I'm I look forward to the book, book on Kierkegaard most definitely. Yeah, that's going to come out. I think with the. Cambridge University Press. It'll be quite short. It'll be on Kierkegaard 
and phenomenology. Okay. Okay. Well, I'll be sure to put uh, links for Lands of Likeness in the description below and to our other discussions on Blonde Show. Um, but Kevin Hart, once again, it's been a beautiful discussion. Thank you. James, thank you. It's always a pleasure to do this.